Well, Merry Christmas and welcome to the movies. Y'all doing all right this morning? Good. Well, last week we kicked off our sermon series with the movie Elf, and we talked about how to find joy this Christmas season. And today we're continuing the series with A Christmas Carol. Most of you have probably seen it. We're using the 1984 version uh, that stars George C. Scott as Ebenezer Scrooge. It is based on the novel of Charles Dickens. And it, Ebenezer Scrooge is an old dude who is unhappy, he's bitter, he's selfish, he's greedy, he is all these different things, and he absolutely hates Christmas. You remember the famous line when everybody talked about Christmas, what would he say? Bah humbug, yeah, that was his line. But on Christmas Eve night, he's visited by four separate ghosts. And now seeing a ghost will change a man. And so he wakes up Christmas morning, and he's been completely transformed. He now finds the joy of Christmas. He runs out into the snow to give presents to Tiny Tim and lots of other people, and he is a different person. It's a great story, but we're going to focus today on one particular scene from the movie. Jacob Marley is the first ghost that visits Scrooge. He is his former business partner, and he is, was in life very much like Scrooge. He was greedy and selfish and didn't care about other people. And what we learn is that because of those things, because of his sins in life, he's forced to become a ghost and wear the chains that he forged in life. And so um, that's the part we're focusing on. And you should have gotten a link of chain as you came in this morning. Does everybody have a little link of chain? If you don't have one, just raise your hand and they'll bring you one. But I want everybody to have a little link of chain. If you've got a link of chain, but you've already laid it down or you put it in your purse or given it to your kid to play with, I want you to take it back out and I want you to hold it in your hand during this whole sermon. Maybe hold it in a way that you can kind of feel the weight of that chain. Maybe not even just in your hand, but in your whole arm. And what I want you to do is to understand that even though this chain isn't very heavy, think about this big chain that you're going to see in this scene so that you can, and hold it where maybe you can sympathize with this ghost a little bit. Check out this scene. Ask me who I was. <laughs> You're particular for a ghost. Who are you then? In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. And can you sit down? I can. We'll do it then. You don't believe in me. I don't. What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your own senses? I don't know. Why do you doubt your senses? Because a little thing affects them, a slight disorder of the stomach. There might be a bit of bad beef, a blot of mustard, a fragment of an underdone potato. <laughs> More of gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. Humbug, I tell you, humbug. Mercy. Dreadful apparition. Why do you trouble me? Man of the worldly mind, do you believe in me or not? I do, I must. But why do spirits walk the earth? Why do you come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. It is doomed to wander through the world and witness what it cannot share, but might have shared, and turn to happiness. <laughs> Chain. Tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link 
by link and yard by yard. Is it pattern strange to you? Or would you know the weight and length of the strong coil you bear yourself? It was as full, as heavy, and as long as this seven Christmas Eve ago you have labored on it since it is a ponderous chain. I see no chain. Mine were invisible until the day of my death, as yours shall be. Well, Jacob Marley didn't have a lot of lines in the movie, but the lines that he had are pretty powerful. My favorite line in what you just watched, and I've supplemented a little bit from the book, he says, I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link and yard by yard. I girded it of my own free will, and of my own free will, I wore it. The sins of Jacob Marley, his greed and his selfishness and his lack of concern for his fellow man were chains that he wore in life, but those chains became visible after he died. And he tells Scrooge, the same thing is about to happen to him, but it's not too late for Scrooge. He can still lay his chains down and be set free. Look, I don't believe in ghosts. This is a fictional story, but here's what I do believe, that we all carry chains in life, not physical chains, but emotional chains and spiritual chains, and those things weigh us down. Sometimes they're long chains that have been forged over years and years. Sometimes they're just little chains from the circumstances around us. You know, there's several words that are usually associated with Christmas. There's peace and hope and joy and love. But a word I think that gets overlooked so often during the Christmas season is the word freedom. The greatest gift of is freedom. Because that's why Jesus came on that first Christmas. He came to bring us other things, but most and foremost, he came to bring us freedom. Freedom from sin and death. And Jesus actually says that early on in his ministry, he is teaching at the synagogue, and he takes out a scroll uh, of the, what's now the book of Isaiah, and he starts flipping through it or scrolling through it until he finds a particular passage of Scripture to read, and then he reads it. And we're actually looking here at Luke 4, 18, uh, 4, 4 through 9, where he does that. He says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus is saying, that's why I was predicted and prophesied to come on that first Christmas. And here I am. A couple of verses later, he says, this passage of scripture is now fulfilled. What Jesus is saying is that he came to earth on that first Christmas to set us free. We think of a lot of things around Christmas, peace, hope, joy, love, family, generosity, but primarily the main thing that should be associated with Christmas is freedom. It's the greatest gift of Christmas. Maybe you thought you were here today because you were trying to satisfy your husband or your wife or your girlfriend or boyfriend or a friend that had been asking you to come to church and you were just trying to get them off your back. Or maybe you thought you were here because you wanted to bring your kids during the Christmas season so they could learn how to be a better person and experience religion. Maybe you just saw something about Christmas at the movies and thought it'd be kind of a, a, a neat place to, to go on Christmas to hear about uh, the Christmas story. But what if... God has a specific appointment with you today, that God has you in this particular place at this particular time so that something incredible can happen, so that you can be set free. Here's what I've been praying for going into this sermon, that you can be free of the chains that wear you down. For some of you, you're going through some pretty heavy stuff and the chains are pretty heavy and they're wearing you down. Some of you have secrets from your husband or your wife, or maybe you have secrets from your employer, your extended family, and those secrets would be pretty devastating if someone found out. Or maybe you've got an addiction that you just can't beat, an addiction to drugs or alcohol or to pornography, and you just can't seem to get past it. Maybe your chain is bitterness against someone else, or maybe your chain is bitterness against God for something that's happened in your life. Maybe your chain is something that was done to you by someone else. You were the victim, and someone did something terrible, but you just can't seem to shake the hurt. 
And, and that hurt has become a chain that you carry. And it's robbing you of your joy and your peace. Maybe you just are chasing the wrong things of life. And you become disillusioned because you keep chasing happiness and acquiring more stuff. But everything you acquire, it gives you a happiness for just a little while. Then it goes away. Maybe for some of you, your chains are shorter. Maybe they're more recent. Maybe it's just frustration or sadness or fear or worry about something going on. Maybe it's disappointment. But what I know is that we all have chains, and those chains wear us down. And my prayer for you this Christmas season is for you to be set free, to allow Jesus to take those chains from you and give you peace and joy. Well, if you have your Bibles, your Bible apps, go ahead and open those up to John chapter 4. We're going to work through our way uh, through a passage of Scripture here where Jesus meets the woman of the well. A lot of you guys have heard this particular passage. We're starting in John 4, 4 through 9. Now, he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you're a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. So Jesus is traveling from Judea and he's traveling back to Galilee. And the the shortest way to get from Judea to Galilee was to go through Samaria. Now, that was the quickest way, but most Jewish people didn't go that way. They took a longer route so that they could go around Samaria. Jews and Samaritans didn't get along very well. The the problem was that they all worshipped the same God, and they had some similar traditions, but the Samaritans didn't follow all the traditions of the Jews, and so the Jews looked down on them. In fact, it was so bad that some Jewish religious leaders prayed that no Samaritan would be raised from the dead during the resurrection at the end of time. That's how bad it had gotten. Look back at verse 4. It says, now he had to go through Samaria. I think that's such a neat verse because it doesn't just say he went through Samaria. It said he had to go to Samaria. Like if I were saying I had to go to Hobby Lobby with my wife, I'd be saying I went to Hobby Lobby, but I didn't want to go. She made me. I had no choice in the matter. But, But that's not what Jesus is saying here. It's not saying that he had to. He didn't have a choice What it's saying is that Jesus had to go through Samaria because he had a specific appointment with this woman at this place at this time. And what if Jesus has an appointment with you in this place and at this time? And so he is traveling through Samaria so something special can happen. Like Jesus might say about that first Christmas, I had to go to Bethlehem so that I could set people free from their sins and from death. That's what he's saying here. He had an appointment with this woman. In that day, women would usually go to the well in big groups, either early in the cool of the morning or in the late evening, and it was kind of a social event, kind of like going to the bathroom now, I guess. And so they would also do it for safety purposes. But this woman is all by herself at the well, and she's right in the heat of the day. She goes out at noon, uh, hoping that she's not going to run into anybody. And, And I think she did that because she was a little embarrassed about her past. She had a pretty rough past, and she didn't want to see the smirks and the snickers of the other women. And probably some of the other women didn't want to go with her either because they wanted to protect their own reputations. So look at verses 10 through 15. So Jesus has asked her for some water, and she says, look, why would a Jew accept water from a Samaritan woman? And look what Jesus says. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you've nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Then the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. So Jesus says, not only would I accept a drink from you, but if you ask me, I'll give you a different type of water and you'll never be thirsty again. And this woman has no idea what Jesus is talking about. So she's like, I I don't even see a bucket. I mean, how are you going to get this water and give it to me? You don't have anything to draw it with. And Jesus says, look, I'm not talking about 
physical water. I'm talking about a different kind of water. And she still doesn't understand. So she's like, okay, well, well, give me this water so I don't have to come back to this well every day. So she's wanting Jesus to give her water so that she can be free of having to come to the well and potentially run into some other people that are going to embarrass her. She's going to be uncomfortable around. But Jesus came to free her from something much bigger. He came to free her from her chains of sin and shame. And so if we look at verses 16, uh, we're going to see what her past looked like. Uh, This is verse 16 through 18. He told her, go call your husband and come back. And she said, I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Well, that went and got uncomfortable. That that seems awfully direct. I mean, like Jesus, well, 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 maybe just be a little subtle here. But I think that's something we miss about Jesus. Jesus is much more direct than we so often think he is. He's direct because he wants to address our hurt so that we can be forgiven and set free. And that's important for us to understand as well. So when Jesus confronts her about her sin, she does her very best to try to redirect and kind of change the subject on Jesus. Let's look at the end of the story. This is verses 19 through 30. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain. But you Jews claim the place we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks." God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back into town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. So Jesus confronts her about her sin, and she tries to change the subject and redirect. First of all, she tries to do it with flattery. I I can see that you're a prophet. I can see that you're a smart man. You're a handsome man. You're a a good man. And and then she does something that we do sometimes. She tries to use religion. She says, look, uh, there's some differences between the way we worship and the way Jews worship, uh, and we don't know which is right, She's hoping that she can get this prophet to change the subject and start talking about religious things. And, and she's trying to get Jesus not to focus on her sin. Trying to redirect Jesus is funny, but we do that too, right? I mean, we say things like, look, I know I'm not really spending the time I should be with my family, but you know, I work really hard to take care of the family. Or I, I know I shouldn't be texting that guy from work, but my husband, he doesn't even really pay attention to me. Or or maybe it's, I know I haven't forgiven that person, but God, you know what they did to me. And we'll even use kind of creative interpretations of the Bible to justify our sin. We use religion. But it doesn't work for this woman. She can't distract Jesus, and neither can we. This Samaritan woman built her chain link by link and yard by yard. Maybe in her case it was husband by husband and man by man. But she had built this chain, and her desperation for acceptance, she had lost out on who she was supposed to be. And and, and so in this moment, she's at a crossroad. She can either keep her chains, keep living the way she is, or she can be changed by Jesus, and she can lay her chains down and be free. Like, if you think about Ebenezer Scrooge and Jacob Marley, they're very similar characters. They both were greedy. They both were mean. They were both uncaring and selfish. The only difference between Jacob Marley and Ebenezer Scrooge is that Jacob Marley carried his chains all the way through his life until he died. Ebenezer Scrooge reached a crossroad, and he laid his chains down and was set free. That's the same crossroad where this woman is when she meets Jesus, and it may be the crossroad you're at this morning. So let me ask you a question. What is your chain? 
Well, what's the change that you're carrying through life? Maybe it's a desperate need for acceptance like this woman at the well. And so you've made bad decision after bad decision, trying to please other people, trying to have acceptance and love, but it doesn't work and you feel even less loved. Maybe it's the chain of selfishness and greed, just like Ebenezer Scrooge. Maybe it's just dissatisfaction with your life and with the people around you, and it's just frustrating you, and life is no longer joyful at this point. Some of you guys know my story. I was called to preach when I was a teenager, but instead I went to law school, and and God blessed me in that. I had a, a lot of success as an attorney. I had success in the courtroom, and I started making lots of money and rising through the ranks of my law firm. And my friends were very proud of me. My family was very proud of me. And I'll be honest, I got pretty proud of me too. And and I became filled with pride. And all of my identity was driven by success and money. And it became a chain I wore because I was tearing down my relationships with my wife. I was hurting my relationships with my kid. I was focused on happiness solely in success in my job and more money. And every time I'd win, I'd get a little happiness for just a little while. It would go away. I just needed one more win. Or if I got a raise, it was exciting for just a moment, and then I just needed a little more money. And the biggest thing that I had done is I had walked away from my relationship with Jesus, and I just wasn't focused on that. And it became a chain that I wore of my own making, and it began to weigh me down. The woman at the well, she meets Jesus, and she has this Ebenezer Scrooge moment. She has a decision to make. And and I love that she tries one last desperate attempt to change the subject. She goes, look, you don't really know about where we should worship and those kind of things, and neither do I. But when the Messiah comes, he'll tell us all that stuff, and it'll make sense. And then look what Jesus says to her in verse 26. He says, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Jesus would so often withhold his identity from crowds or from religious leaders, but in this moment, when he knows this woman is hurting, and needs to meet the Messiah, he's as direct as he is anywhere in the Bible. He says, I'm the one that's coming. I'm the one that's coming to set you free. That's when everything changes for this woman. I I love what she does next. She had come to the well on a mission to get water, and her water jar was an important part of that mission. But after she's changed by Jesus, what does she do? She leaves her jar and runs back into town to tell people about this man that she just met. That water jar that was so important was just left behind. Her priorities had changed. She'd been set free. Before, she was trying to avoid people by going to the well in the middle of the day, but now she's going to seek out people to tell them about how she's different, that her chains were gone. Look, I I don't know exactly what changed for me where I decided to let Jesus have my chain. If I had an Ebenezer um, Scrooge moment, it was probably when my wife was was diagnosed with lupus. And suddenly I realized that life could look different if I lost my wife. And suddenly I realized my priorities were completely a mess. And so I began to reconnect with the church and reconnect with my family. And most importantly, I began to reconnect with Jesus. And over the next three years, Jesus began to transform me into a different person. And then 12 years ago, I answered the call to preach finally. And so here I am today, boring you about half the time, making you late for lunch some of the time. And I wouldn't change a single thing because I laid my chains down and I gave them to Jesus. And so the question for you is, will you be like Jacob Marley and hold on to those chains through life? Or will you give them up and give them to Jesus? What will you do this morning? There are a couple of things that we can learn from this Samaritan woman about being free of our chains. Here's the first thing. We have to acknowledge our sin. And and that's not easy. We so often try to hold that back from other people, even hold it back from Jesus. That's what this lady was doing. She went to the well at the middle of the day because she didn't want to be confronted by anybody else because it brought up her sin. But it didn't work. Jesus tells the woman that he knows exactly what her past looks like. And he knows yours as well. If you're trying to hide your sin, you're just fooling yourself. You know what it is. Jesus knows what it is. And you're not hiding anything. I I think that we so desperately want to keep our sins back from other people and from Jesus. And here's the thing. If you've got a secret sin, you may think that the worst thing that can ever happen is for that secret sin to be revealed. 
That's not the worst thing. The worst thing that can happen to you is that you carry your chains of that sin all the way through this life and you die being worn down by that sin, never being free. That's the worst thing. Get your struggle out in the open so that you can be forgiven and healed. Get help for your addiction or your anger or your bitterness. We talk about being uh, the kind of church where we can be open and discuss our, our struggles and our failures and our sins because being open about it is the only way we can give up our chains. But it takes courage to come into the light. It takes a lot of courage, but it's in the light where you can be set free. When you own your sin and mistakes, you can be set free. Here's another thing to learn from this Samaritan woman. If, you've got to, if you want to be free, you've got to embrace this incredible truth from Jesus. Jesus loves you desperately. You have to embrace that. You are a son or a daughter of the king. He wants to change you. He wants to set you free. He made you worthy. See, I, I think this woman at the well, she really felt like she didn't even deserve to be forgiven for what she had done. And, and so she was ashamed. She was embarrassed. She had guilt. And she didn't think she was worthy of being forgiven. And so she built her unworthiness chain link by link and yard by yard until it was dragging her down. But remember, Jesus went out of his way for this woman. Verse 4 says he had to go to this moment because he loved her. And he would do the same thing for you. He wants to do the same thing for you. See, Jesus doesn't see you for what you were. He doesn't even see you for what you are. He sees you for what you can be through him. For some of you guys, you've stopped the sin. You, you're no longer sinning, but man, you just can't get rid of the guilt and the shame. Maybe it was an affair you had, and you just can't forgive yourself for that. It stopped, but man, you just struggle with feeling worthy of love at this point. Maybe it's an abortion. And because you had an abortion or you encouraged somebody else to get an abortion, I mean, you just... You just, you beat up on yourself and you think you're not worthy. Maybe you went too far with a boyfriend or girlfriend. It hadn't happened again, but you're struggling with the guilt and the shame that comes out of that. Maybe it's a divorce or a failed relationship and you just can't get past the guilt and the shame. Maybe shame and guilt have become constant companions for you. It's, it's a chain you carry and kinda, you've kind of become accustomed to it at this point. It's just part of who you are. But it doesn't have to be. The Christmas story is just for you. The greatest gift of Christmas is the gift of freedom. Jesus came to earth on that first Christmas, not just to set you free from your sin, but to set you free from the guilt and the shame of that sin. He came to set you free from self-doubt and self-loathing. The Christmas present Jesus is offering you today is freedom, but you have to accept, accept it. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 8, 1 through 4. He says, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. That's the Christmas story all summed up right there. Jesus came to set you free. There is now no condemnation. There is now no, not measuring up, feeling inadequate. Jesus came to set you free from judgment. For those who are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. Remember what Jacob Marley said to Scrooge? He says, I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link and yard by yard. I girded of my own free will, and of my own free will, I wore it. You made your chains. You've added to them over the years and over time, and they're starting to wear you down. If you're honest, it's taking away your joy and your contentment and your happiness. Some of them, some of you guys, you've had the chain so long that you've kind of got adjusted to them, and it feels like you're wearing them pretty well at this point. You're accustomed to your chains. 
You know, in prison, there's something called institutional syndrome. And, and it's this syndrome where people that are in prison for a very long period of time, they grow so accustomed to the, 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 the walls of prison and being told exactly what to do and where to be that when they're released, they can't handle the freedom. It's overwhelming to them. And a lot of those inmates will actually commit new crimes and let themselves get caught so that they can go back to prison. It's not where they want to be, but it's all they really know. In the movie, The Shawshank Redemption, Morgan Freeman plays an inmate named Red, and he's been in prison for 40 years, and when he gets released, he's struggling to adapt to the freedom of the outside world. And I love this quote he has. Here's what he says. These walls are funny. Now, he's talking about prison. First, you hate them. Then you get used to them. Enough time passes, you get so you depend on them. Maybe that's where you are. Are you still holding that little link of chain that you have? That, that's just a little link of chain, but it's to remind you of the spiritual and the emotional chains that are dragging you down. You don't have a physical chain, but you do have chains. And the challenge this morning is to give that chain to Jesus and to be free. Some of you are thinking, you don't really deserve to be free. You don't deserve forgiveness. You don't deserve for the guilt and shame to be taken away. And you're right, you don't. The woman at the well, her shame and guilt, she had earned it. But Jesus took it away, not because of what she did, but because of what Jesus did for her. That's the amazing gift of freedom at Christmas. We get grace. We get grace that we don't understand. We get grace that is beyond our capacity to even deal with. And that grace, if we accept it, then sets us free. That's this beautiful gift of freedom in Christmas. Look, I, I don't know what your sin struggle is. I don't know what your guilt and shame is. I don't, I don't know what your circumstances are that are dragging you down and stealing your joy and your happiness. But I do know this, grace is greater. Grace is greater than your sin. Grace is greater than your guilt and your shame. It's greater than your circumstances. It's greater than your anger or your bitterness or disappointment. It's greater than your worry and your hurt. It's greater than the struggle in your marriage or in your family. Grace is greater. Jesus wants to set you free, but you've got to accept this gift of freedom. Let's pray.